Hi, I'm Pastor Marvin Winans, and welcome to Holy Convocation 2006. Well, this is the second day, Monday night, and I know you're going to enjoy this man. God has raised him up from humble beginnings, from the streets of Brooklyn to a general in his army. Prepare yourself to hear a great word of God from a man that has been there and done that. He is the senior pastor of the Bethel Family Worship Center in North Carolina. He is none other than Bishop George Bloomer. Hear the word of the Lord. Can we give Jesus a great big hand clap? He's certainly worthy to be praised. Well, that was a patty cake. Can we give Jesus a great big hand clap? Now, I, I, I don't do a whole, whole lot of talking outside of the word of the Lord, so while you're preparing yourself to take your seats. I want you to honor the set man of this great house and the set man of this great organization, Pastor Marvin Winans. God bless you. Amen. Mom and Pop Winans. Amen. It's one of my good friends by way of Brooklyn, Pastor Donnie McClurkland. And to the quorum of pastors, hey Kim, to the quorum of pastors and leaders and my partners from North Carolina, God bless you. It's just good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen and amen. Have your seats, get your hands on your Bibles. It's time for the word of the Lord. You find us reading out of the book of Ezekiel, Old Testament scripture. Ezekiel chapter number 28. Ezekiel chapter number 28 and verse number 13 the new king james version puts it this way it says thou hast been in eden the garden of god and every precious stone was thy covering the sardius the topaz the diamond the beryl the onyx the jasper the workmanship of thy tambrance and of thy pipes were prepared in thee the day that thou were were created thou art the anointed cherub that covereth and i have set thee so thou was up that walked up and down in the mist of the mountains in the midst of the stones of fire. Mm -hmm. Verse number 15 says, you were perfect in all of your ways until iniquity was found in thee. I wanna read that one more time. You were perfect until, turn to your neighbor and say, you were good <laughs> until. Uh, say it to somebody with some conviction and some authority. You, you were good uh, until. Yeah, you, you were perfect in all thy ways until iniquity was found in you. Father, bless this word tonight in the name of Jesus and cause us to realize that it is you that have brought us to this place at this time. We pray that the word that would go forth tonight would be a word that you selected for your people's hearing. My obedience in delivering this word should bring us a corporate testimony that it was good for us to be here in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want you to say, just, just leave just a little thought with you on tonight. Uh, say to your neighbor, say, if it hasn't come, it will come. Uh, that's not strong enough. There's thousands of us in here tonight. Let's say it with authority. Say, if it hasn't come, it will come. Now, I want you to be assured. Uh, I'm going to give me the 15, 20 minutes. But I want you to uh, 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 be assured that tonight, that what you couldn't get last year, you're going to have it by the end of this year. All things that are, all things that are pertaining to righteousness and godliness. Turn to your neighbor and say to your neighbor now, say, if it hasn't come, it will come. One more time with authority, if it hasn't come, it will come. I was invited to preach at New Birth in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, to preach uh, the dual services on a Sunday morning. I received the call to, to go to minister there on Friday evening. We flew down on Saturday evening, prepared ourselves for the message. Uh, in the first service, the Lord came in and he moved graciously. But in the 10 o'clock service, something spiritual happened. As I stepped on the platform, the Holy Spirit said, whatever you 
have prepared yourself to minister, forget it. I want this spot. And I yield myself to the presence of the Holy Spirit because I knew that God was going to do something awesome in that place. When time came for them to call me to the podium, I came and I stood there and while I was praying and preparing to give the message for the day, there was a young lady with a white blouse on and a black skirt in the, at the top of the balcony at New Birth and she stood up, she did like this and then she sat back down. And I thought to myself, what was that all about? But I kept on ministering. Well, she would do this five or six or seven times. She'd just stand up, go to the edge of the balcony as if she was going to jump and then sit back down. I began to minister the word of the Lord and just as God spoke, I started preaching that Sunday morning at 1045. The service was over at four o'clock that afternoon. God moved in that place in such an unusual way where demons were being cast out and God was setting the people of God free and reintroducing to the body of Christ the power of the name and the power of the blood of Jesus. Can I preach in here tonight? And so after, after ministering, I went upstairs and then I had a session with staff members who were there and we began to pray. So I didn't leave the building that night until about 6.30, 7 o'clock, maybe even 8 o'clock. So it was a, it was a night when, where the Lord just showed up and did some miraculous things. Now, for whatever reason, we have people today that know a lot more about church than they know about God. I'm going to say that one more time. We know a lot more about church than we know about God. We know about church, the organization, but we don't know about church, the organism. And church, the organization is jacked up, toe up, but church, the organism is intact. Ah, yes, it's intact. And so I began to minister to staff members and what have you, and ultimately, the job of every preacher is not to come in with his own fire, and certainly not to bring in strange fire but to come in and be wise enough and sensitive enough to the pulse and the heartbeat of the leader and we come in, back our U-Haul up, shut our power down and plug into the source so that we can be an extra extension of what God would have us to receive. Now for whatever reason I want you to understand that we have come to a time in the day where Satan is bold enough to come in and attack us in our churches. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care anymore because we know more about church than we know about God. But I believe there's a few people in here that know a little bit about God. And, and you don't need a whole lot. You just need a few people to understand who you are in the realm of the spirit. After I ministered to the staff and ministered to, to those uh, persons and I was ready to go home, uh, a young lady came and she was persistent and she said she wanted to talk to me. She wanted to talk to me. I want to speak to you. I want to speak to you. I want to speak to you. And rarely do I speak to people after service. I don't take numbers. I don't hook up with people. I want to be able to minister and move on. Well, she was persistent. And Bishop said, well, see what she has to say. Talk to her. She wants to speak to you. Maybe the Lord really delivered her today. She came in and she said, I couldn't leave this building without sharing with you what happened. She said, the moment you stepped to the podium and took your text, I heard a voice, a satanic voice that told me, to throw myself from the balcony to stop you from preaching. She said, but I felt a force push me back in my chair. She said, I began to battle. You know, I'm preaching right now, and you know, a whole lot of folks don't believe what I'm talking about because we know more about church than we know about God. And so we have reduced Satan to this principle of evil and he really doesn't exist anymore. I come to tell you tonight that the devil is real and some of you brought him in here with you. And this word is going to show him the door in your life. Look at your neighbor and say, if it hasn't come, it will come. And uh, she shared that with me and she said, and this force was strong. She said, almost, I could almost feel a fist snatching me up out of the chair and a hand on my back pushing me, trying to get me to push. She said, but there was another force that kept on pushing me back. And she said, finally, when I was going to obey these voices that I was hearing in my ear, she said, you said, I bind the spirit of death and murder. And immediately she said she felt the force thrust her back into the seat, but this time she felt the force sitting in her lap. So God threw her in the chair and sat on her 
until the threw her in the chair and sat on her until the message was finished. Now, without getting too deep, let me share a few principles with you. The scripture teaches us that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Most of us know that, right? But to understand that text, we would almost have to go to seminary to understand it. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So most times when you ask people what is faith, they quote the scripture and never get around to telling you what faith really, really is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And the only way that we get faith or we can obtain faith is through and by hearing. And so if faith cometh by hearing and by hearing and by hearing and by hearing and by hearing. Come on. And by hearing and by hearing and by hearing. That means that we have to protect what we hear because ultimately what we hear sets our belief system. So faith cometh by, say it was real strong, say by hearing. By, and by what? And by what? Ain't strong enough. Come on with authority. Say it. Come on. What? And by what? And by what? And by what? Now, I know we want to get deep and say faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How can we hear without a preacher? That's the scripture. But before we get to the scripture part of it, we want to deal with what faith really is and how you get faith. Faith ultimately comes by what you hear. Time plus time equals influence. So if you are around negative people and they speak negative things, I don't care how positive you think you are, eventually you're going to begin to sway towards the negative. Faith cometh by, let's do it with authority, by what? By hearing, and by what? Hearing, and by what? Hearing. So now Satan knows that faith cometh by hearing. He knows that good faith and spiritual faith comes by hearing the word of God. He also knows it's impossible for you to hear without a preacher. And impossible for the preacher to preach except he was sent to you and your ears was tuned to his. Now watch this here. One of the greatest problems that we're having in the body of Christ, and you did say this is convocation, right? Well, the job of the convocation uh, and the convocational speakers are to illuminate and make the congregation aware of who is sitting before them. It's the solemn assembly. It's the gathering together of the saints to get your marching orders for how things and what's going to happen. And I come to tell you already that 2006 is the year of supernatural success, so you set up there already. But unless this man release this anointing in this house, you'll never get it. And so ultimately the devil wants to attack the voice that you hear. Now Christian television is a blessing, and I know it's a blessing. I thank God for Christian television. But if you watch Christian television all day long, at the end of the day, you're going to be a sick puppy. Because everybody's on there preaching and talking about everything. So the problem that most churches have is this, is that you will stand pastor and teach and give your people what God has given you to give your people. And you'll minister to them three to five hours a week. Then they go home pastor and watch Christian television all day long and become confused by the time they come back here. Because what happens here is what God has given this man as the mandate for this house. It does not matter what you see going on all around the world. What really, really matters is did God send you to this shepherd and are you his sheep? Ah, five amens out of the house. And so the enemy wants to attack your word of faith. That's what he wants to do. And it's not something new. He's been doing it for years it's exactly how he works he's been doing it for years so in our scripture lesson on tonight in the book of Ezekiel the Lord speaks to Ezekiel and tells him he says listen I want you to understand that we're dealing with a spirit in the land a powerful satanic spirit you, you don't mind if I minister on warfare tonight do you a powerful satanic spirit you know uh, you know, you're looking at the news and the news talks about the gas prices and the saints are going on gas price visuals, believing God, the gas price is going to come down low. You know, we don't really, 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 really read the Bible. And uh, so we're having gas prices issues. We're at war. There's conflicts. We, they got the Da Vinci Code out now and folks are beginning to doubt that, you know, about the Da Vinci Code, you know, pause for station identification. I ain't never been to heaven. So they can talk about that all day long. 
I've never been to hell and don't plan on going. They can say that that don't exist. That, that, that'd be a good hookup for all of us, right? But they can't tell me that there's no God. Oh, yeah. You can tell me that there is no heaven, there is no hell. You can do all the talking you want to talk about. But when you start saying that Jesus did not die on the cross, I know you done lost your cotton-picking mind. Three principles describe all of theology. Christ's virgin birth, his sinless life, and the resurrection. And take away any one, any, any one of those three and immediately you slip into the occult. Jesus was born. Jesus died and Jesus got up. How do you know you're saved? He got up. How do you know you're healed? He got up. How do you know you're delivered? He got up. How do you know you're set free? Somebody shout out and say, he got up. Now, I just gave you a word of faith and there's a few of you in here, glory be to God, you don't care what Dan Brown puts out. You know one thing that God lives because he lives on the inside of us. Then, brothers and sisters, what is Satan trying to do? Satan is trying to snap, snatch the name of Jesus from us and the blood of Jesus from us. And I don't care how many songs we sing, the church today is in trouble when uh, young people from age infancy to about 18 years old don't know any of the blood songs. No, they don't. Don't know any of the blood songs. Don't know any of the consecration songs. Don't know any of the songs of salvation. Y'all in here almost say, we can bump, we can rap, we can put anything we want to it. But I come to tell you, when you start wrestling demons, the only thing that is going to make demons move is the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as the... There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And what? And what? And sinners plunge beneath the flood. The thing that constantly shocks me is that when I was coming up in holiness... You couldn't mention the name of Jesus without tearing up the church. But you can say Jesus and folks will sit here like I just said P. Diddy. When I say Jesus, you respond whether you like it or not. There is power in the name of Jesus. Did you hear what I just got finished saying? Let me tell you the battle that we're up against. Andre Crouch wrote a song some years ago, said, you may ask me why I serve the Lord. Is it just for heaven's gain? Is it just to walk those mighty streets of gold or just to hear the angels sing? Is it just to drink from a fountain that never shall run dry? Is it just to live forever in the sweet by and by? He says, no, if heaven never was promised to me, Neither the promise that men may live eternally. It's been worth having the Lord in my life. Living in the world of darkness, he came along and brought me. Uh, Andre had a divine revelation. You can say there's no heaven, but you can't say there's no Jesus. I know in whom I believe in. And I am persuaded that he is, that he is able. In a time and a day where the church is being attacked, we must preach the name of Jesus. There is truly a warfare going on and the saints are oblivious as to what the devil is doing and what is happening. Could it be that the Lord has blessed us too good? Look at somebody saying, no, not me. Could it be? Listen to me on tonight. There's a story that's told in Ezekiel 28, 13. A story that's told Ezekiel is going to need this information because God, for the first time, explains and he describes who Lucifer is. And number one, he says, thou has been in Eden, the garden of God. And he tells us what Lucifer's covering was, like ours is flesh and, and sinews and bones. He tells us what Lucifer's color, the topaz, the emerald, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the kabunko. But then he says something here that's very, very powerful that the apostle Paul speaks about later on. He says, he says 
Uh, the day that you were created, he said God had prepared him with tambourines and pipes. So when God created Lucifer, he created him with the ability to minister musically. I'm going to preach here in a little while. With the ability to minister musically. So people said that Lucifer used to be the head of the choir in heaven. Lucifer wasn't no head in no choir in heaven. Lucifer was the choir. When Lucifer lifted up one hand, rhythm came out. When he lifted up the other arm, beat came out. Lucifer was so awesome that Lucifer gets a place in the New Testament after the apostle Paul is caught up into the third heavens, he comes back to earth with a divine revelation. He said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I become as Lucifer, sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And what Satan has done, he has messed with our minds concerning sounding brass. Every time we hear the word sounding brass, we think of something that is negative. But sounding brass isn't. Sounding brass speaks to a person who has the ability to skillfully blow the trumpet. Skillfully blow the trumpet. Tinkling cymbals is the individual who has the power to keep the beat to the rhythm. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So sounding brass is like this. Squeal it one time. Tinkle the cymbals. Touch your neighbor and say, that sounds like church to me. And a few of you done started rocking back and forth. Uh -huh. I don't. Well, Bishop, what is happening? See, when you're filled with sounding brass and tinkling cymbals, you can live like the devil in hell and still quicken. Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Look at your neighbor and say, mm-hmm. We know more about church than we know about God. So we can do people wrong and still dance. We can fauna and Kate and still quicken. Y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. Because the saints don't know the difference between noise and the anointing. Which means that Satan can set up shop right in our house. I wish I had a church in here tonight. So God tells this fantastic story that I want to tell to you today. It's a fantastic story to Ezekiel so Ezekiel will understand and warn the children of Israel as to who and what we are dealing with. We quote scriptures like, no weapon that is formed against the shall prosper. We sing songs as it relates to that. But there's a warfare in the text that we must get to on tonight. My parents, my mom and my dad had nine children together. My father went out of the wedding barn, had 15 other children by six women in Red Hook projects. I dropped out of school in the ninth grade, second grade reading ability. I smoked so much uh, heroin and crack and till, till I just could not read at all couldn't read anything. I would give my life to the Lord in Rackers Island prison. God put me, I said God put me, God, I said God put me, God put me in prison as my processing chamber. A place where he could get his yes out of me. Ah, look at somebody say yeah, 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 yeah. A, a, a place where he could get his yes out of me. It seemed like it was impossible. When I went into jail, I went in and I, I, I made a vow to the Lord. Lord, if you deliver me out of this situation, I will preach your word. I got saved behind bars and I, I, and I came out from behind bars preaching the gospel. But two years into my preaching the gospel, my old cocaine addiction came back. And I tell you the truth tonight, for two solid years, I shot up and snorted cocaine before it was time for me to preach the word of God. Now the saints don't like truth, but here it comes. And folks that knew more about, folks that knew more about uh, 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 church than they knew about God, y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying, 
saw me anointed and wonderful, but I was toe up and I was messed up. And we got some folks that are around us that truly love God. But, 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 but what was God's purpose in allowing that to happen to me for that particular season? God wanted to give me a testimony. A testimony. And I ain't talking about this stuff testifying where you get up and you just thank the Lord for your life, health, and strength, food on the table, clothes on your back. Giving honor to God, my pastor, the bishop, shepherd, mother, the head of the weeping, wheeling committee. No, no, no. That's a speech. A testimony is an undeniable experience that you've had with God in the past to sustain you for any present or futuristical difficulties. A testimony is what the old songwriter said, when I think of the goodness of all I, all I got to do is think about what he has done and praises manifests now. And my turning point would be one night, one night shooting up in Red Hook Projects and got a hold of some bad heroin laced with rat poisoning and embalming fluid. And my heart went into cardiac arrest. And those fools dragged me to the hospital and dropped me in front of the doors at the emergency room and didn't take me in. Someone discovered me. They worked on me for two hours. At the end of, this is my testimony and I know what I'm talking about. At the end of the two hours, I felt as if I stepped out of my dead flesh. I was standing in the room watching them put the toe tag on my toe and throw the sheet over my head. And my mother came into the room. And I'm sorry, I don't have a conventional testimony for you because I know that, you know, you know, when these things happen to us, someone saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled. No, nah, that wasn't my case. My mama heard her son was dying at Long Island College Hospital. So she got down there. She had McCarty rum on her breath and a cigarette in her hand. And she came in there. And when she saw me laying there, she started screaming and hollering and begging God and fussing and cussing me out. But somewhere between the fussing and the cussing she made a pact with God she said God please don't take my child away from me and immediately I heard the angel of the Lord say get back into the body y'all ain't hear what I'm saying and tonight I'm here to preach to a waiting congregation about destiny every person in this room tonight who's been dealing with Reoccurring addictions. God is about to give you a breakthrough tonight. Somebody say tonight, 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 tonight. Say it tonight, tonight, tonight. If you don't mind, touch somebody that's next to you and just say tonight. You could have just released an anointing that will destroy the yoke of the devil in their life tonight. I've come to the conclusion and to understanding that things don't happen to us just to happen to us. Nudge your neighbor and say, I could be your answer. God will allow you to go through pure hell to give you a testimony so that someone else will be able to come out. Yeah, nudge your neighbor and say, don't act funny. I could be going through for you right now. Ah, hallelujah, somebody. And so when the Lord spoke to me and he says, I want you to Go down to Detroit to the convocation and speak. I said, Lord, what do, you, what do you speak in a house? But it would seem like these people have heard everything. Been blessed with the greatest of greats. The Holy Spirit said to me, he says, but I want to plow through the house tonight with deliverance. Ah, if you know what I'm talking about, just stand up, turn around one time and take your seat. I want to plow through the house tonight with deliverance. That's what I want to do. Hallelujah. See, some, somebody's been praying for a breakthrough. High five somebody say, here it is, here it is. It, it, it's about to come.